Dr. Walton is a practicing clinical geneticist at Geisinger Health System, where he also works as a clinical informaticist and pediatrician. Dr. Walton's background in genomics, data architecture, and artificial intelligence have enabled him to play a unique role in implementing genomic data in the EHR at Geisinger, where more than 90,000 patients have had an exome sequencing performed as part of the MyCode program. Please welcome Dr. Walton. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here because we are at an incredible point in time where technology is so advanced that it's no longer a barrier. So what I'm about to present is the results of years of untreated attention deficit disorder. So you've got to really pay attention. So I want to give you a little bit of my background and then dive into artificial intelligence, then go into genetics, and then describe the marriage of the two technologies. And I have to do this all in 20 minutes. So I'm going to have to talk really fast, which is what I normally do anyway. All right, so I've always had this strong interest in science and computers, so I was kind of like a nerd squared. But I was also good at art, so I ended up, you know, based on this strange intersection, I started in the field of 3D graphics and animation. And there was this critical point in my career where I had to make the decision. I was actually being recruited by Disney, and I had to make this decision whether to go on that path or stick with science and medicine. Now, the choice I made is obvious because I'm here today, so now while my colleagues are making movies like Transformers and Star Wars and Jurassic Park, I'm putting genomic data into the electronic health record, which is so much cooler. So needless to say, I continued into the field of medicine without medication. And in between, I was trained in biomedical informatics, where I spent two years in genetic epidemiology and then switched gears due to some obstacles and did two years of machine learning and artificial intelligence. In retrospect, this is a really good, you know, it was a really valuable tool set to have that I could use in my career. So I ended up completing my, tra my training in pediatrics, clinical genetics, biomedical, and clinical informatics. So most recently, I discovered Geisinger. It's a very innovative uh, organization who has a large sequence population of over 90,000 patients who've had their genetic sequence done. And so this was such an attraction to me because I wanted to play with all this data. In addition, they had this large cohort of researchers who also had attention deficit disorder and good support groups. And so they've done all these crazy things and they just implement them like starting a fresh food pharmacy. And so instead of... Um, prescribing medications, you give them healthy foods, and doing things like um, offering exome sequencing as part of primary care as a preventative measure, and even uh, starting programs where you can get refunds on your medical care if you don't think it was sufficient or it wasn't good enough. So they, have all these, they implement all these crazy ideas. Now, when I got this job, I moved out to northeast Pennsylvania, which is a very strange place, and the office totally makes sense after you move there. And um, it, it's like you move back in this place that's 30 years back in time in a hospital system that's 20 years ahead of your time, so it's kind of like going back in time 50 years if you do the math. So when I moved out there, I found this incredible house. It was this big house and everything, it had this full-size gym. So I have this full gym with all the machines you can think of. I've got treadmills, I've got this complete circuit, I've got everything you can think of. And it's such a cheap price, because it turns out anybody who actually has money to afford something like that uses it to move out of Northeast Pennsylvania. <laughs> so anyway, I, I ended up buying this house, and I've had it for like a year, so I've had this full gym for a year, and I haven't lost a pound of weight. So it turns out that owning a gym does not make you lose weight. It doesn't matter how far away it is, it's only two sets of stairs and it's still not working. And the point I want to make with that is that we have all the technology we need. We have everything that we need to do all kinds of cool stuff, but we have to use it. We have to use it. And there's some barriers to use that I want to talk about so we can figure out how to get over them. So to start with, you know, I have this background in AI and genetics and wearable devices, and I feel like I'm driving this Ferrari, but I'm driving it off-road in Moab. 
So I've got this rocky terrain and boulders and dips and unpaved roads. And it doesn't matter how fast the car can go if the road and the infrastructure are not in place to allow for the speed. So one of the things that I did is, you know, data is amazing. You can look at your data from your, your organizations, and you can figure out all kinds of cool things. And so one of the things I did is I looked at the way that we were testing for epilepsy. And I found that a lot of the things we were doing were completely ineffective. And there was a far better way to do it. And so I presented the data to people and said, here's the way we should do it. And there was some resistance, but you couldn't really argue with the data. But there was a lot of resistance because, oh, this is the way we've always done it. This is a standard of care. So what, what happens is we, we have this thing called defensive medicine, where we do things that are the standard of care because we don't want to get sued, even though they're not necessarily the best thing to do sometimes, I think. And it's very hard to change things in healthcare. We have to have these long studies and all these papers written and all these people get together to make, you know, to, to form these standards, and, and you cannot change fast, even though we have this ability with all this data to change things fast. So finally, somebody from Harvard came and kind of said the same thing I said, and they said, oh yeah, maybe that makes sense. <laughs> so some people started to do it, but then there was the next barrier. The next barrier was the payers. And the payers are usually two steps behind in what they will pay for. And so it's very, very frustrating because we have this ability to rapidly impact patients and optimize treatments, but we don't have a healthcare system that can adapt to it. So we need to work on building an infrastructure that's more adaptable to advancement in medicine. So I want to talk to you a little bit about AI because it sounds really complicated, but it's actually not. It works just like your brain. So it's a system that learns based on experience. It takes a whole bunch of inputs and compares them to an outcome, and it adjusts, its, it adjusts itself to optimize the inputs in relation to the outcome. So one of the examples that I always use is if just the simple motion of throwing something into the garbage, right? You wad up a piece of paper and you throw it into the garbage. If you ever thought about all of the inputs that go into that, it's actually kind of amazing. You know, I watch my kids develop as part of the way I learn about how to think about AI and how to think about these machine learning algorithms. And if you think about all the time it took as for a child even to figure out where their arm is in space and to grab things and to move them and do them, it actually takes a lot of input. And it's all of these inputs feeding over time that train the system. And the more you do it, the better you get because you're relating all these inputs. So you've got all these proprioceptors, your, your vestibular system, your visual system, all these inputs coming together to figure out an outcome. And that's exactly how neural networks in artificial intelligence work. So one of my first applications to this was with respiratory syncytial virus um, prediction models. So, you know, this has a huge impact on children's hospitals. So we were trying, this was in, in Utah, and we were trying to figure out, you know, if we could predict these outbreaks so that we could be better prepared for them. And so I gathered all this data, and this is kind of the cool part. You start to think about all the data that's out there. So you have data that might lead to an outbreak, that might cause an outbreak, and this is maybe like weather variables and social interactions between people and different things like that. I mean, we think one of the big predictors was holidays, right? So we think of these as really happy times where everybody gets together with family, when really you're, you're being put in these incubators and giving each other diseases. <laughs> and so it, it's actually really effective data to help predict disease. <clears throat> so we were able to actually, with reasonable accuracy, predict RSV outbreaks. Now, some of the strong predictors were climate data, and you know they're seasonal things. I was thinking initially snow might be part of it, but snow wasn't. And one of the reasons is, there in Utah, that the weather variables that ended up being valuable were variables that led to an inversion. And this, Utah is this, you know, where in Salt Lake City you have this valley, it's surrounded by mountains, and we have these inversions where all this pollution and gunk and junk just gets trapped in the valley. And it has a real significant impact on the respiratory system. And this appeared to be important. And so we also looked at... Um, pollution data, and, and there wasn't enough to get a significant result yet, but that's something that looks like it could be contributing. Now, some of the other things that we looked at, we looked at store purchases, Google searches, things on Facebook, Twitter feeds. There's so much data out there that is available, even traffic patterns, TV viewing patterns. There's all this data that we could use to predict these outbreaks. <clears throat> so when you talk about these very complicated networks, and you think about them in terms of a human, a human is limited to their own experience. 
So they have all the inputs that they've received and they relate them to outcomes and they use that to determine what they're going to do and, and, and provide care. The value of a computer is the computer can take the experience of thousands or even millions of humans. And it can combine that, and this is especially important with rare disease, to figure out what might be the best thing to do or predict outcomes or predict what's going to happen. So that, that's kind of the, be the benefit. But I also want to talk about the danger of AI in general. So I love AI. I think it's great. I think there's a lot of potential, but I think there's a danger that we should all be aware of. And that is that sometimes AI, AI is very good. And that's when it becomes dangerous because we start to trust it. We start to trust it so much and then we, we kind of lose our clinical judgment. And that's where the danger is. And you saw this with self-driving cars. We're very good at making cars drive themselves. But we've had some terrible accidents because people became too reliant on that technology and let go of their own judgment. So this is dangerous. It's just like GPSs. Like who, who actually gets directions anymore. Like, you, you, you plug it in your GPS and go. And this is particularly frustrating in Pennsylvania because every time I ask somebody about how to get some place or an address, they're like, well, just turn here and then go to McDonald's and turn around, you know. And they try to give me all these directions. I'm like, give me the address, give me the address, give me the address. <laughs> and, and finally, you know, after 20 minutes of, de of description, they give you the address. But you get so used to GPS that, that you just plug it in, you go. You don't really pay attention. You almost lose that navigational skill. I was driving in a place that I had, hadn't been before once, and, and I was trying to find a Costco, and I was driving, and it was cornfields for miles, and I thought, there's no way there's a Costco here. But I continued to follow my GPS because I trusted it, and I ended up in the middle of a cornfield. <laughs> and there was no Costco. But that's because I trusted the technology over my own judgment. So this is just one of the dangers we have to watch. So as I mentioned, despite the challenges, AI is good and can be used in less intrusive ways. They're not quite as vital that are really important. So one of the cool things that we're doing is we're using it to capture um, information about patients from their chart. So as a geneticist, you have to do a really thorough chart review and go through all the records. So with AI, you can actually intelligently process all of those notes and capture all the phenotypic elements and create a profile of the patient in, in really, really quickly. I think we're processing... Um, it's about 15,000 notes a second. So you can actually process all that really quickly and get a phenotypic profile of the patients. And, and when, as I was doing this, you know, I thought about, you know, how do, we, how do we think about speech? How do we pick up this information from speech? And a lot of people say, oh, we have to know meaning of the words. That's a little bit important, but this is another thing I learned from my kids. When my six-year-old daughter came up to me one day, I think I was watching a football game or something, and she says, what does the mean? And I'm like, well, you, you say it all the time. And she's like, I know. What does it mean? And I'm like, um, it's really nice outside. <laughs> do, um, do you want to go play or something? But if you think about it, she's using it. And she's using all these words without really thinking about the meaning. And it's pattern recognition. And if you have enough data to recognize all these patterns, you can pretty easily interpret what, what these words are meaning and pull terms and phenotypes out of notes. And we're, interestingly, we're also um, working with Sick Children's in Toronto for, on this system that actually listens to the physician-patient encounter and picks up the terms and puts them in a list. And so it just captures them as people are talking. <clears throat> now I want to talk about, you know, I've talked about AI, I want to talk about genetics and the critical role that this data is going to play in the future of medicine. As a clinical geneticist, it's not uncommon for me to see kids that have gone years or even a decade without a genetic diagnosis. We have, and one of the reasons is we have such a hard time getting this vital information that lies at the basis of human health and disease. It underlies everything. It determines, you know, what we like to eat, the sicknesses we're susceptible to, how susceptible we are to even, even um, you know, I, I gave a lecture once to the infectious disease on, on the genetics of infectious disease. That's very genetic. So this is so important. And one of the things we found with neurodevelopmental disorders and autism, if you, you know, now with exomes, you know, the, doing exome sequencing, we can actually call copy number variants which are picked up by chromosome microarrays. So typically the process, if you're lucky enough to get, you can get a chromosome microarray and then you go to exome if you can't find anything, if you're lucky enough to get that approved. Now we can actually call that from exome in most cases. So 
with that combination of calling the copy number and doing the sequencing, we get a 45% diagnostic yield for neurodevelopmental disorders from sending an exome. That's amazing. What kind of test do we have that gives you that much information? And the price is coming down significantly. And so why isn't that a standard of care right now? So there we've actually talked to our health plan and that is the standard of care. You can actually get exome sequencing as, a, as, a, as first line, the first thing that you do. Same with epilepsy. Epilepsy has similar yields, 40 to 45 percent, depending on which study you look at. It, I, I would say 30 to 45 percent, which depending on which study you look at, if you look at some of the older ones. But we're learning, we're learning so much. We have so much information, and it changes every day. And so why isn't that a first-line test? So when you, when you think about it, it's not just that you want to find something that's actionable, that you can change a medication or do something like that. One of the most valuable things is finding out things you don't have to do. Finding out tests you don't have to do. Finding out, you know, stopping the patient from going to additional visits that they don't have to do. I mean, I, I'm lucky. I, in general, I have healthy kids. I have one child that ends up with an orthopedic surgeon every other year for some reason. And, and that drives me nuts that I have to go to, like, two follow-up appointments. I mean, it's very disruptive. It, 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 it's disruptive. And if we can prevent that and we can get a diagnosis early and get them on the right treatment, and the other, the other huge advantage and benefit of this is that we can provide them with the right services early on so they can meet their full potential. It doesn't matter how bad, you know, if, if, you, if, if you have something that affects a child neurodevelopmentally, a genetic disorder, you, just, you need to get them to the best of their ability and potential by offering these services, and the impact won't be near as severe. And the earlier you do it, the better. So, I would really, you know, one of the things I, I want to say is we need to build this infrastructure. We need to, I would like everybody to have this as a standard of care and to change the way that we look at these disorders and, and increase the importance of genetics. So there are some challenges, of course, and one of them is interpreting variants in genetics. We have this variant of unknown significance problem where a lot of times we send a genetic test, we get a result back, and we don't actually know what to do with it. So this is the danger when you sequence everybody of just calling, looking at the report and saying, oh, you, you have a disorder that causes developmental delay, and they're like in Harvard or something. Actually, there probably are a lot of people in Harvard with developmental delay, but, but you know, so, somewhere... And, and so you, you really have to take into account the phenotype. And this is where you can use AI, so you capture all this phenotypic information and you combine it with the genotype, which can allow you to do real-time genetic diagnosis in the clinic. Another way, so I mean, you can imagine, you come into your clinic, you start typing in there, it's picking up all the information, and all of a sudden a pop-up comes up and says, hey, this child may have Dravet syndrome, right? So you know what they have, how to treat it, and what the next step are, and that's part of it too is how we communicate this information to patients. One of the things that we're um, employing there is chatbots that help use AI to help answer patient questions because we have, you know, as we start sequencing everybody, we have this huge strain on our genetic counselors and our geneticists. We're starting to address some of that as AI, with AI as well. So all of these things I've talked about, real-time genetic diagnosis, you know, communicating with patients with chatbots, all of this is possible. And I know it because we're in the process of implementing it today. So what I would say is I want to extend this power to everyone and change our system to adapt to newer technologies faster. Get that road paved so I can get into that Ferrari and drive it as fast as I can go. Thank you. And I don't actually have a Ferrari, but um, I'm going to start a GoFundMe account. If anybody's interested, you can get back with me.